What's up, everyone? Kyle here. I am super excited to share that my audiobook version of Travel Tips is up now. You can find it on Audible, Libro.fm, and anywhere else that you get your podcast. Go check it out um, and, and buy a copy. It also has 30 minutes, uh, a little over 30 minutes of bonus commentary uh, that isn't in the actual book. So that's a little added bonus. Um, but go check it out. Uh, I appreciate all the support and I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone. This is Our Travel Experiences. I'm your host, Kyle Rasmussen, and today I have with me a good friend, Michael. Michael, how are you today? I'm doing good, Kyle. How are you? I'm uh, doing good as well. I'm uh, excited to hear about your uh, fishing stories. I know you've uh, done all sorts of different fishing in all various locations around uh, the U.S., um, so I'm excited to hear about those. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a lot of fun. I mean, so a little bit of backstory on me. Um, I've been fishing, I mean, pretty much as early as I can remember. There's pictures of me with a fishing rod where I could hardly stand with it. Yeah. Um, But my grandpa has taught me pretty much everything I know. He instilled that passion in me um, really early on. And at the end of the day, I just think it's a great way to get outside, uh, focus on your mental health and... uh, you know, you also, you, when you get out on the river or the lake or whatever, it's nothing else matters other than the moment you're in right there, um, you know, trying to catch whatever you want to catch, mm-hmm. um, which I really love. Um, but in terms of, you know, spots I've been fishing, I mean, I could talk for a really long time about stuff, <laughs> but um, in terms of stuff that I think would be most interesting for listeners to hear about, I mean, number one is uh, Florida fishing. So I grew up um, on the East Coast and out here in Washington, when you meet people, they've all been to Hawaii because mm-hmm. uh, it's a super short flight. But when you live on the East Coast, it's a considerably longer flight. Yeah. So. <laughs> Rather than people going to Hawaii on the East Coast, they all go down to Florida. And uh, that's what my family would do. We would at least try to make it down there once every other year, once a year. Um, After my parents divorced, uh, my dad and I have uh, made some fun trips down there together, which has been great. Um, And in, in Florida, you can do anything and everything. They've got incredible freshwater fishing um you can literally walk down the street pick a canal that looks like a mud hole (laughs) and catch some of the most beautiful fish you've ever seen Uh, it's literally an aquarium down there uh (laughs) like they've got these uh type of cichlid called a peacock bass they're just green yellow you name it they've got super cool (laughs) spots on them they're super aggressive. You can catch largemouth bass down there. Um, they probably have a thousand different varieties of, of aquarium fish that live <laughs> in those waters because uh, people are crappy. And instead of uh, flushing their fish down the toilet or giving them away, they release them into the wild. And yeah. when you've got uh, 90 degrees and humid year round, uh, a lot of those warm water species from South America thrive. Um, which is really cool to be able to catch all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Not so great for the natural ecosystem yeah. down there, <laughs> but uh, the freshwater fishing in Florida is incredible. Um, saltwater stuff, I mean, inshore, offshore. Uh, my absolute favorite is getting on a short little skiff and fishing shallow water in the Everglades. Um, you see sharks out there. Um, you know, catch a bunch of different types of fish, uh, sea trout, redfish. Uh, I've, I've hooked a triple tail out there, which I'm sure not a lot of people know what that is, but it's a really interesting fish that usually lives offshore uh, on weed lines. Every once in a while, they'll drift in inshore, but um, they lay on their sides and just drift in the current and they disguise themselves as a weed patch. 
So huh. they drift in with the weeds and they'll eat little fish that are using the weeds as cover. Yeah. So that's, that's their way of ambushing their prey. <laughs> that's wild. Super cool. <laughs> um, and then on top of that too, I mean, one of the coolest experiences I think I've had out in the Everglades, um, there was one time, or I guess two experiences. One time we were really getting back, um, into the islands, into these really small little channels that are maybe big enough for two boats to go through at a time. And um, we found uh, this area over to the right that was all matted down, looked like a nest. And uh, we were talking about what it was. Our guide said, yep, that is a saltwater crocodile den. we see her every once in a while out here, but when she's egg laying, that's where she'll sit for months until hmm. all of her eggs hatch. And uh, we thought we weren't going to see her. She wasn't sitting on the nest, but we got about a hundred yards further into the channel and her head popped up <laughs> and was just staring at us. Um, and a saltwater crocodile, I mean, that's what Steve Irwin's forte was yeah, yeah. those things grow to 25 feet long Jeez. it is one of the most unreal things you've ever seen to see a creature twice as long as your boat staring at you God. um and this didn't happen to me but a story that i heard on that same nest um she was sitting there and they brought the boat up alongside it and there was maybe a foot uh between the shore and the boat but the nest was another 20 25 feet back so they Mm. thought it was a safe distance uh the crocodile got spooked that they were so close and her only way of escaping was to run out to the water towards (laughs) the boat and they didn't give enough space between the shore And um, the channel for her to get in. So she ran across the deck of the skiff (laughs) to get into the water on the other side. Oh, yikes. Could you imagine a (laughs) 25-foot reptile running across your boat, literally, like, as close as you and I are sitting? Probably even closer than that. (laughs) Yeah. Like, one wrong move or it decides it wants to take a nip at you. Oh, my gosh. You could be done. Yeah, screw that. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, on a lighter note, too, uh, you see so many dolphin out mm. there. Um, it's super, super cool. Um, there was one day we were out there. We saw a pot of dolphin maybe 150 yards away, and our captain slowed the boat down and started pounding on the hull of the boat with <laughs> um, a little gaff that he had. And I guess uh, the dolphin are used to the humans enough and know that when a human makes those vibrations or that noise in the water, it means they want to see the dolphins. Yeah. And the dolphins will come play (laughs) with you. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, we sat and waited for the dolphins to approach our boat. And uh, we were just running super, super slow. And they were using, I don't even know the physics behind it, but using the wake of the boat to kind of just glide and ride along with us. You're sitting down on the front, looking (laughs) down and they're staring right back up at you. It's cool. It's magical. Um, man, have you ever heard about how those things hunt dolphins? Yeah. Um, so this isn't down in Florida, but I was uh, striper fishing in Bethany beach, Delaware, um, about a couple hours from Philadelphia where I grew up and we weren't expecting to ha- catch a whole lot. Um, but we had seen some fish moving in the surf. So we figured we would give it a try. And, um, I started probably catching a fish every three casts out of this school of 12 to 20 inch mm-hmm. stripers that were 30 feet off the bank and, um, out of nowhere, a pot of dolphins shows up maybe nine or so or eight or nine. And um, they started attacking the school of striper that I was trying to catch on the beach. And they came in in twos, pairs of twos and threes 
and it was so coordinated they would attack from different sides hmm. to keep them corralled. Yeah. So they would have one group come and hit them from the right side, another group would come and hit them from the left side, and then the last group would hit them from the front and push them back into the shore. Hmm. And they did that until there was no more fish. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's dol- dolphins or something else, man. Huh. That'd be wild to, mm-hmm. to see that. Yeah, I I wish we had we have porpoise out here, which are still cool. And mm-hmm. I mean, hump, the humpback whales on the west coast also are special in their own right. We might yeah. not have bottlenose dolphins, but man, seeing a humpback whale breach, yeah. that's something else. I actually, I was really lucky. I got to see that one time when I was going out to the Channel Islands. Yeah, um, and that was. She it was a mom and she had her her little baby with her. They were in close to the shore, mm-hmm. uh, but just just floating along. You could just see see them, see the top of them. It's really really lucky to see a baby too. Yeah, that's not common at all. It, it must have just been born or something like that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know how anything about fish, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that mm-hmm. was that was cool. Yeah, yeah. There's so many so many wilds. The the ocean is just a wild oh man place. <laughs> Yeah, that so that reminds me. Um, yeah, on the subject of humpback whales, um, it was the first time uh, we had ever made a trip up to Alaska. Um, so my mom, uh, her biological father, so technically my grandfather, but um, my grandma remarried when my mom was a toddler. So her dad now is who she considers to be mm-hmm. her dad. Uh, actual dad but biological dad lives in Ketchikan Alaska so we went up and visited him he's a great guy has a wonderful wife and all my mom's half siblings are awesome and they're super fun to be around um we went out salmon fishing the first day we were in Ketchikan it was the first fish we had hooked my little brother called the first fish so I'm like okay you (laughs) do your thing. You reel it in. And, uh, when we were getting in there, uh, Andy, that's my, uh, mom's biological father's name was talking about, yeah, we're probably going to see bears. We're going to see more bald eagles than you've ever seen in your entire life. Um, we're going to see whales, seals like this, that, and the next thing. And, you know, I think we all had a little bit of doubt, we, we were like, yeah, like he's just trying to get us excited and hype us up. Like there's no way that all of that is going to happen in the three days that we're there. And, um, first day out salmon fishing, my brother's reeling in his first fish and a whale breached 50 yards behind the boat. Oh, wow. And my little brother was dead convinced that the fish he was reeling in was that whale <laughs> <laughs> and not an actual fish. <laughs> I would think that would feel a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that line I mean, would probably it's, immediately be gone. <laughs> it's, it's the difference of uh, having a fair shot versus uh, tying your line to a submarine or yeah. <laughs> a freight train or something like that and expecting to stop it. But I think he, he was probably 10 or 11 years old at the time. So he... <laughs> just thought it was the coolest thing ever. I mean, yeah. it was super cool, but I was like, Patrick, you've got a fish on, like you see the whale, it's swimming the other way. You're, you're still bringing it in. It's not the same thing, but that trip, we saw everything that he said we were going to see. They have a house uh, right down on the water where there's actually a creek that flows into um, the sound there that um, connects to a salmon hatchery. So they have salmon running probably six months out of the year right in front of their house, Jeez. which is so much fun. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, you just walk 50 feet out, out onto their rocks and start casting a line and you'll catch something. <laughs> um, and then uh, the bald eagles up there, man. They are like seagulls. They'll fly in flocks. Really? Um, When you're out on the flay table cleaning fish, they're out there on the rocks fighting over the fish carcasses. It is 
the most unbelievable thing. Um, and last great Alaska story that I have actually is funny because we were talking about this before recording the podcast. I was trying to think of like, okay, what's, you know, like some sketchy experiences because <laughs> I've had some sketchy ones, but I just, I wasn't happening to be, to be fishing when I was doing them. Um, this was the sketchiest fishing experience I've had where I was out on that Creek, uh, catching salmon. There was a couple other guys on the opposite bank cause that was the public beach, mm. but I was on the private side cause grandpa lived up there. Yeah. Uh, benefits of having a family member yeah. <laughs> that lives on the water, but I had three fish sitting on the bank next to me. I was super proud of myself. I was like locked in. I'm like, all right, I'm going to catch another two or three and that's my limit and we'll have a great dinner tonight. And, uh, I didn't notice I had a guy on the other bank who had been like waving at me and he started shouting and I'm like, Hey, like what's going on? And he points upstream and I turn and look, there's about a 600 pound black bear <gasps> walking down the bank toward just straight towards me. Oh like gosh. I made eye contact with it. <laughs> like it is coming to me. It is not just wandering. <laughs> um, and I think it smelled my fish. Yeah. So I slowly backed away as you do with bears um, I took cover behind a very large rock <laughs> about 30 feet away from my fish pile. And he came up, smelled them, picked up one of the fish, but the tide was running out on the Creek. So there were live fish that were getting washed down the Creek and they would be splashing here and there. And he heard a live one coming down the Creek and he took, left my fish turned around and decided he wanted to work for his catch. <laughs> and then he didn't catch that fish, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I'm very happy that he uh, decided to turn around and walk the other way instead of coming back and taking the easy meat. <laughs> yeah. So did he just, he just left. Yeah. That? Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's so common to see bears up Man. there. Uh, They've, they've had bears get into the grocery store before they're in town. Um, and then what I was saying with cleaning the fish out on the flay table and the seagulls will be fighting over the carcasses. Um, you'll see them out there fighting and all of a sudden they'll all fly away. <laughs> and that's when the bears come in. He'll pick up whatever he wants and keep on walking. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's not uncommon to see four or five bears a day out there. Wow. It's I'm, crazy. I'm sure that got your heart pounding a little bit. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I think there's only two or three times that I've had my heart pounding that much. And <laughs> it was either a car accident or um, when I got charged by a moose uh, this last hunting oh, season. Gosh. But. That's a story for a different day. Slightly <laughs> Definitely different want to hear subject. about that. <laughs> yeah. We'll definitely talk about that once yeah. we're done recording. This. But um, yeah, man, I mean, just wildlife when you're getting out and fishing, it's I even out here in Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, when I go up to Montana, um, I've always got bear spray and a gun on me mm -hmm. at all times just to be safe. Um you see a lot of wolf tracks yeah. um, when you're getting out in the back country. Um, bear and cat tracks, not so much, but um, you know they're around, mm -hmm. which that's that's the creepy thing. I'm I'm not so afraid of bears because if they hear you coming, they're gonna leave. Yeah, um, and then if they're there you're going to hear them because mm -hmm. uh, they weigh three to 700 pounds yeah. and they'll break everything they touch as they're meandering through whatever it is. Uh, cats, on the other hand, they could be in a tree. Uh. They could be in the ground. They could be sitting on a cliff above you and you wouldn't even know they're there. Yeah. Um, 
there's been times where I've seen really fresh cat sign, but you don't have that sixth sense feeling that you're in any danger. Mm -hmm. And then there's times where I've been out there that you don't see a single track, but you can feel their eyes piercing the back of your head. (laughs) You know, they're there. You have zero idea where they are. And that is the creepiest part Mm -hmm. about it. Um, Once you see them, it's too late. (laughs) Yeah. Usually. Uh, Thankfully we haven't had a lot of cat attack in Washington, but you no, know, if you know, I were to be down in Colorado, I feel like it's three or four times a year. There's a video coming up on social media yeah. where a guy is getting back down by a cat and shooting the ground in front of it. And it mm. still doesn't stop. It's, that's a scary thing when you find a cat that has zero fear of humans or has never yeah. seen a human before. It just sees you and it thinks, man, that's a really big meal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it makes you feel like, you know, I, I think humans are so removed from the food chain mm-hmm. in our daily lives. But once you're out there in the wilderness, you're a part of it again. You uh, realize just how uh, vulnerable, vulnerable you are. <laughs> and, the, and the worst part about it is that we might be the most intelligent species out there, but unless you're, living in the city or in the suburbs you're a part of the food chain yeah. <laughs> um and you're not the top of it either mm-hmm. which is very humbling yeah uh, for sure <laughs> but yeah i think it's just great to get out there um and honestly that humbling and that reconnection i feel like is something that gets left out a lot in our daily lives. Mm. Um, you know, similar to you traveling and running, it's like that, that reconnection to who you are and why you do what you do. Um, but yeah, let's see what other. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let's go back to the the deep sea fishing in Florida. So what, what's been some, tell me one of those fun experiences. Oh man, deep sea stuff. Um, so I think the coolest thing, Well, just about Florida in general, I touched on it earlier, is the variety. Um, You know, deep sea fishing, you can do so many different things. Mm -hmm. You can go to a wreck and drop down pieces of fish and squid and be catching snappers or groupers all day. Um, You can go out and you can troll big baits or you can cast live baits out on weed weed lines and catch mahi mahi catch tuna um things like that my personal favorite is uh drifting live baits for sailfish um every once in a while you'll catch a marlin uh down in florida but the sailfish they migrate right through the gulf stream off the eastern coast of the state so Um, if you get out there and there's fish in the water, odds are you're going to catch at least one. Hmm. And when you hook up to them, there's, it's nothing like Hmm. you've ever seen before. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but the sailfish is the fastest fish in the ocean. Really? It's been clocked at 78 miles an hour. Oh, geez. Yeah. So you hook up to one of those things. They not only swim (laughs) really fast, but they jump. And they jump a lot. So they will run for 50 yards at 70 miles an hour. And then you'll see them way out there. They'll be dancing on their tail, (laughs) trying to get rid of that hook. And the dorsal fins on them, when you get them in, you pull it up. And it's why they've got their name. It's literally just a giant sail (laughs) on their back. And it's, I don't understand why they have that big of a fin. Um, it's pretty interesting. I'm assuming that they'll use it trying to corral bait fish and they'll <laughs> raise it and use it like a wall. Uh, yeah. Um, makes sense. but when they're swimming, it's never out. You would mistake them for a Marlin nine times out of 10. If you were <laughs> to just see one swimming in the water, but man, they're a super cool fish to catch. Um, it's gotta be a fun fight to get that thing in. Yeah. It's, it's never long because 
they might be the fastest fish in the ocean, but they tire themselves out pretty mm -hmm. quickly. So 10 to 15 minutes in, usually by the time they've done their fourth run and jumped seven or eight times, they're ready to come in and get the hook taken out, but they put on a great show. <laughs> it's super entertaining. Um, there was one fish that I caught the last time uh, we were doing an offshore trip in Florida uh, called a permit. Um, and I had seen them on the covers of fishing magazines and on Instagram and stuff. And I had always known that they were a sought after fish to catch like a uh, Bonefish is another very popular one that people will travel the world trying to catch a bonefish. It's one of those bucket list mm. things where they're super rare, hard to catch, but when you catch one, it's super, super rewarding. Um, we were finishing up the day after uh, riding around and pitching weed lines for Mahi. Um, we were just going to pull up on a wreck, drop anchor, and uh, try to catch our limit of snappers before going in. And the second we get up to this wreck, I'm sitting in the tower with the captain and we can see just these giant dark silhouettes that are suspended. We're like 60 feet of water. They're suspended maybe at 20 feet, a school of 20 of them cruising around. And the captain just started going absolutely ballistic. He's yelling at the mate to get a bait in the water, get a line in the water. And uh, the second he got the bait out, it hit the water. He closed the bail. The fish bit it instantly. <laughs> and it was just one of those super, super hard fights where the fish is running. It's not letting you take any line on mm. it. Um Permit's probably one of the hardest fighting fish pound per pound I think I've caught in my life. Um, and it was a big one that I caught too, but I didn't understand at the time. I had known that they were a sought after fish, but I didn't understand what all of the hype was about getting a line in the water until I was talking to the captain afterwards. He's like, you realize you just caught a once in a lifetime fish. Jeez. There's people that will fish for five or 10 years and be lucky to catch one half that size. Wow. Um, which, yeah, I'll make sure I send you a couple of these pictures yeah, that'd be cool. after the fact. Cause I don't know if there's any way to have pictures connected with the podcast mm -hmm. just so people can see what I'm talking about. But those permit are absolutely incredible. And I <laughs> didn't realize how rare they were. Um, until after I had caught one, um, which just made it even more special. I mean, yeah. if I were to just catch it and they would have, wouldn't have said anything, I would have been like, man, that's a really cool fish, a lot yeah. of fun, but I wouldn't have had the appreciation for mm. it like I did. Um, which was super awesome. Yeah. Um, other cool stuff in Florida. I mean, my favorite fish to eat out there is blackfin tuna. Mm. Um, you'll catch a couple of those things and get back to the dock, cut up some fresh sashimi on the flay table. And <laughs> it is the best uh, after fishing snack you mm -hmm. can have some fresh sushi. But I don't know what it is about being out on the water and then coming back and eating that fresh fish. Yeah. Man, that's mm -hmm. like the best thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a lot of restaurants down there too, um, where you can, uh, keep your catch after the day mm. and bring it to the restaurant and they'll cook it for you. Oh, that's um, cool. one of the days we did that inshore trip and we caught our limited sea trout, um, Sneak sea trout snappers, a um, couple extra things that day. But we took all of our flays to a restaurant that was right next to the dock. And I think they charged us $35 to cook everything. <laughs> they prepared it three different ways for us on this giant sampler platter. So we had uh, like beer batter fried, uh, grilled, and uh, I think blackened. Uh, was the third one, but it was really cool just to try all of those different preparations yeah. for the same fish and 
the different seasonings and how that changes the flavor of the fish um, was really cool. <laughs> Which one did you like best? I'm I'm a sucker for beer battered, <laughs> beer battered or blackened. I think yeah. that's that's my favorite. Um, I definitely would say though that the mahi um, that we caught on that trip, uh, the mahi was best grilled. Mm. I think that that's one of my favorite fish to eat. Super, yeah, super same. fresh. And, um, it honestly doesn't need a whole lot of seasoning or anything like that. It's got a great flavor on its own. Um, but yeah, mahi, that's another fun one to catch. I've never caught a big one, but they'll jump the same way sailfish do. And they'll go absolutely ballistic. Yeah. <laughs> um, What's the longest fight you've had to get one? Oof. The longest fight I've ever had was on a nine foot long lemon shark. Um, I believe that was 45 minutes. Mm. And I took a nap after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was probably just dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that, that was a stand up fight, too. Um, a lot of times when you're fishing for sailfish or other billfish like that, um, you'll have a chair that mm. you can stick the rod in and you have a little bit more leverage. Um, with this one, I was using the heaviest setup on the boat. <laughs> I had nothing tied to the boat, nothing holding me in place. And this thing just absolutely worked me. <laughs> um, I would get it to within 25 feet of the boat and we got a great look at it and it would just turn and run another hundred yards. Jeez. Um, it probably did that five or six times. Um, but yeah, those big sharks, man, they, they never give up. They're feisty. Um, and plus they're super pretty. Uh, I'll, I will say this, uh, not, not to get political, but as uh, an advertisement for the Florida fishery, um, a lot of people are worried about shark populations, things like that. I'd say internationally, yes, that's a problem. Uh, but down in Florida, they have zero problem. Hmm. I mean, in fact, I would say they have a shark problem because uh 75% of the shark species that they have down there are all federally protected. Hmm. So they've got a lot of sharks. They're growing really big. And even the ones that you can keep, uh, not a lot of people keep them and not a lot of people eat them. Yeah. Which is why they have millions of bull sharks in their hmm. waters. And I'd say that's the biggest problem is, the most common shark species down there is also the most aggressive, uh, which is why we see Florida having the highest shark attack numbers out of anywhere in the world. Yeah, it does year. make me feel safe on the beach down there. Yeah, I, I actually saw a video <laughs> last night of um, there was a guy fishing in the Everglades and he stuck his hands off of the side of the boat and was rinsing <sighs> blood or fish oil or whatever off of his hands. He had a shark bite his hand and drag him into the water. Oh God. Yeah. That's, that's another video I've got to show you <laughs> after this, but yeah, I saw that and that's something that I've done before. Yeah. So yeah, the fact that there's that risk and you never know where that seven to 10 foot long animal could be. I mean, yeah, the saltwater crocodiles, all that stuff that's mm. scary, but you'll see them if they're coming. Uh, a lot of times you won't see the sharks <laughs> until it's too late. Uh, nope. Mm. <laughs> but they're super fun to catch. Um, yeah. I mean, going back to all the sharks that they have in Florida, like I'll just go out there on a bridge, hang out and drink beer until it gets dark. And I'll use a couple of the fish that I caught off the bridge during the day, put on a big hook, wire leader, super heavy rod, 
drop it off the side of the bridge. And I think my best night on the bridge, I caught 12 sharks in Jeez. three, three hours. Wow. So there's a lot of them. They come, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. They come out at night and they're feisty. Um, yeah. The hardest part is getting the hook out of their mouth after you've yeah, how do you do landed that? <laughs> um, on the bridge. You've got to scout it out beforehand. Um, you've got to figure out what you're going to do mentally before you've even put a bait in the water. Cause it can happen so quick. Um, the bridge that I fish on the most, uh, I had a spot picked out where I could at least get the shark shallow, get a rope on its tail and drag it to a shallow enough spot where I could work with it. Um, because you don't want to be in knee deep water with a pissed off animal like yeah. that with real big teeth. Um, but yeah, m most of the time I would kind of just cut the wire and leave the hook in just to <laughs> prevent anything potentially happening to my hands. <laughs> yeah. But um, that's the nice thing too about fishing in salt water is that salt water is so corrosive that even if you do leave a hook in their mouth, it'll usually rust out within a month. Wow. And Jeez. it's not going to inhibit their ability to feed at all or anything like that, um, which is great that it's super fun for the angler, but also super safe for the shark. Because mm -hmm. um, that's another thing for me is if I'm not going to keep the fish, if I'm not going to eat it, um, I want to make sure that it's healthy yeah, and yeah. still swimming once I've had my experience. Because mm -hmm. it wouldn't be fair to catch the fish, kill it, and then just dump it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dang, that's wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I know my, uh, my uncle, when I was down in Florida, mm -hmm. he, we were just kind of hanging out on the beach, and then there was uh, some manta rays that <clears throat> were coming by, and he was just casting out there, and he caught one of those, and it was fun just to watch him you know, work it and yeah. bring it into the shore. And, and Did it jump that. at all for you guys? Uh, I don't remember it jumping at all. No, but that's another thing that you've got to look up is jumping manta rays. <laughs> Those, some of the coolest videos you'll ever yeah. see in your life is a 30 foot long stingray jumping <laughs> out of the water. It's, you would never think that that's something that they would do, yeah. but during their migration, their mating season, mm -hmm. I guess it's it's either to knock off parasites or it's like a mating ritual, but huh. they'll jump 10 feet out of the water. Jeez. It's insane. Like I said, the ocean is terrifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. They got all kinds of monsters in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, even in freshwater, we've got those monsters. Mm -hmm. um, just... Out on the Columbia River, we've got 20-foot-long yeah. sturgeon. Yeah. There. You hardly ever see them, but they're there. Mm -hmm. um, I went on a uh, striped bass fishing trip um, earlier in – or it was over Memorial Day. I was um, back visiting the East Coast, and uh, we were trolling in the Hudson Bay. Like, we could see the New York skyline out there. It was yeah. super cool. And, um, our captain was like, yeah, like we might see a sturgeon or something like that. It's pretty common for them to jump. And we ended up seeing four or five of them jump that day. Wow. They were all that five to six foot range, but they have a, a green sturgeon out there hmm. on the East coast, which is nowhere near the size of the white sturgeon that yeah. we have out here. Um, yeah, quick West Coast uh, sturgeon story uh, just of me seeing the biggest fish I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, we So I'll start out with the funny part and then work to the okay. sturgeon part. So uh, this was the funniest, I think, fishing story that I have. My grandpa has a 24-foot-long uh, jet boat. Uh, the thing probably weighs... 4,000 pounds, super heavy. 
And um, it's got an inboard jet in it. So it's got all the controls in the front. The jet motor is actually mm. inside of it rather than it being on the outside of the boat. And um, we didn't check any of the things with the boat before we put it in. We made sure the plugs were in. So we did that. We didn't sink. But we got in the water and we didn't realize the steering column for the jet was locked up. So we launched the boat. We're all sitting in the boat. We started it up and we're like, all right, let's go out to the fishing spot. We were going to be fishing the mouth of the click attack um, on the Columbia and the boat wouldn't turn. <laughs> so me being the helpful grandson, I am, it was 50 degrees outside. I, uh, stripped down into my underwear <laughs> and I jumped into the water behind the boat Oof. and used a broomstick to <laughs> jack, uh, the I stuck it inside of the jet motor and jacked it to where it would free up and start moving mm. back and forth again. So that was an interesting start to the oh. day. And then we get out there um, and we were fishing for salmon. We didn't catch any salmon, but when you're using salmon eggs on the bottom, uh, a lot of little sturgeon will pick at it. So we'll, we probably caught 20 of these little 12 to 14 inch sturgeon, which is super cool knowing how big they get to see yeah. a small one. <laughs> and then I'm just sitting there on the side of the boat in la la land, staring off into space towards the middle of the river. And all of a sudden I see the biggest fish I've ever seen not jump out of the water. It came up, a third of the way out of the water <laughs> and its body that was out of the water. It was only a third of the way. Like I said, it's eight feet long. Jeez. Yeah. It just went up, fell on its back, made a giant splash. No one else saw it, but me. <laughs> so it's one of those fish stories, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the only time I've ever seen a sturgeon in person. That was well over 10 feet. Um, you'll see them out, uh, in the snake river hell's Canyon mm -hmm. down there. It's not uncommon to catch eight or nine footers, but those truly giant sturgeon that people would talk about from back in the day, they, yeah. they're hard to find now, but I guess they still exist. Yeah. They're out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Really deep in the middle of the Columbia River where it's like 300 feet. Yeah. The river's too swift to sit stationary and fish mm. it and too deep to get an anchor down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those are wild. I mean, those are prehistoric yeah. animals. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I've seen, I, we went fishing down on the Columbia when I was, gosh, I was probably like eight at the time. And like, mm -hmm. it was like a family outing and all the, all the guys in our family went out there and uh, we were fishing for sturgeon, but I think, you know, we caught those like eight or nine footers, you know, but those are still, like, oh so yeah, they, you know, they got some 20 plus footers out here. Those, those eight or nine footers. I mean, the biggest sturgeon I've caught was three and a half feet long and that was still a 20 minute fight. Yeah. So I those, can only they assume, so wild. yeah, those, <laughs> those big fish you were bringing in, some of them probably took over a half hour. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't think I caught any of the big ones, but I mean, there was like, you know, it's some long fights for sure. Yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah. It, was, it was crazy. <laughs> I I remember the first like we we got there on like a Friday afternoon, and I remember like our guide was like, "Oh yeah, let's just go out for a little bit, like you know, just see what we can do here yeah. before it gets dark." So we go out there, and like within the first twenty minutes this huge cargo ship comes by and this is like, you know, I'm, I'm young and I haven't been on a boat too many times. Like yeah. no, nothing like that, like on a big river, big mm -hmm. boats and that sort of thing. Um, and so this cargo ship comes by and pushes up this wave and we're on this fishing boat, which decent sized boat, yeah. but not that big. And I remember us going all the way up, like, and then just, 
crashing down super hard. <laughs> I was terrified out of my mind. I'm like, I'm going to fall into this river. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I barely know how to swim. Oh, if, if you uh, fall into that river too, it's yeah, it's scary. Yeah, that was <laughs> there. That was there's a lot of water moving through the Columbia. Uh -huh. man. I mean, yeah. I don't know if anyone listening has ever driven over a bridge or driven through the gorge, but every single time that I drive down uh, from Goldendale to Biggs Junction, mm -hmm. I'll look off to the side because there's a couple buoys down there underneath the bridge, and they're always halfway underwater, like getting dragged because yeah. yeah. there's just hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of water mm -hmm. moving through it every second. It's yeah. crazy. I, I think that's one of the prettiest spots right there uh, mm -hmm. as you're crossing into Oregon and just like looking out and see the Columbia mm -hmm. go for a long ways. And, uh, but uh, yeah, man, I mean, is there anything else that? Uh, well, yeah, sure. Just uh, maybe about? like a little bit about uh, fishing and in the rivers up here. In oh Washington. yeah, man. Well, here Our in Washington, lakes, yeah. yeah, there's a million and a half places to go fish. Um, <laughs> right, right now I've mainly, uh, just been fly fishing strictly. Um, throughout the winter, we were spending a lot of time out on Lake Roosevelt, uh, fly fishing from the shore, which was always a fishery that, I never knew was there. I knew that you could get out there on a boat and you could troll deep for them and you could maybe catch a couple, but I not only didn't realize how many fish you could catch from shore, but <laughs> just the average size we were catching out there too. I think it was all winter was 16 to 22 inch long fish. And uh, every once in a while, we would catch a baby salmon out there too, which there's no ability for salmon to get into Lake Roosevelt when they're running or when they're spawning mm -hmm. or anything. So the only way that that fish got there was getting washed down from Lake Coeur d'Alene all the way down the Spokane River Jeez. to um, Lake Roosevelt, which means it had to go down... I. I measured it at one point. I can't remember how long it is, but I think it's like 126 miles of river or something like that is the Spokane. And there's seven dams along it. Jeez. So it got washed down 126 miles. And there, keep in mind, there's no fish ladders on any mm. of these dams. So it got washed through dam turbines. Yeah. Seven of them. That's insane. And made it down. There. <laughs> it's like, talk about the great escape. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always super cool. Um, right now, the Spokane River has been fishing incredibly. So since that opened up uh, at the beginning of May, we've been fishing that a lot. Uh, it's been incredible. Um, even right here in Yakima, we've got one of the best trout rivers in the entire mm -hmm. state with the Yakima River. Yeah. Um, I actually went up the canyon last night and... I only hooked one trout. Uh, I hooked it. It skyrocketed out of the water on me and through the hook. But <laughs> I had a guide drifting by in a boat by me when I did it. And he's like, hey, I saw it. That counts. <laughs> and then I, I caught a bunch of little baby salmon too, uh, which the Yakima River has never had a super productive salmon run mm -hmm. on it, at least in the last 50 years. So seeing that many juveniles in the river system is really promising for yeah, that's good. what the run's going to be in four years. Because I've I've been catching more salmon on um, the Yakima recently than I have trout, hmm. which is yeah something surprising. Else. Yeah. yeah, they're not very big, but they're super aggressive little six to twelve inches and. You drop something in front of them. They don't care what it is. They just want to eat and get big so they can yeah. get out to the ocean. Um, and then just in terms of lakes, um, I'm not super familiar with central Washington lakes, so I can't really speak to the overall Yakima area. I do have a couple pins on spots that I want to check out out here once the weather starts to cool down. Um, but on the east side... 
we've got hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. Um, all of those Scabland lakes down by Ritzville, Moses Lake, um, they're all incredible. Um, even the lakes up north, too. Um, there's one one lake I'm thinking of that is just northeast of Newport, and I have a couple buddies that'll be mad at me if I drop the name of yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I mean, we were fishing fit like pinky fingernail sized flies out there, and the average size fish you're catching is 18 inches long, wow. and a, a healthy 18 inches, like they've got big bellies on them, and they're all eating well. Um, and I think that was my favorite thing about lake fishing early spring this year is I've always thought that you needed to fish a big meaty looking fly that could pass as a spinner or something like that. You would throw on a spinning rod Mm. to get their attention. But I never realized that you could just fish these tiny little natural looking (laughs) patterns and full big trout better than you could with just a giant flashy in your face lure that would piss wow. them off. Um, there's one lake that I'm thinking of uh, another one that I'm <laughs> sorry, guys, I'm yeah. not naming it. If you uh, want to reach out to me and talk fishing, uh, my Instagram is M Boken B O K E N two, three, four. Feel free to go. slide into my DMS and I'd be more than happy to, Start you out with some yeah. spots. You but, can use his guiding services. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One, once we get that uh, up and running, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. But um, there's another lake in north central Washington that is on a Indian reservation. And um, it's got a special breed of cutthroat trout in it that is the biggest substrain of cutthroat in the world. Uh, hmm. The world record was caught out of Pyramid Lake in Nevada. It was 26 pounds. Jeez. The state record for Washington was caught out of this lake I'm referencing is, I think if I remember correctly, it was close to 13. So it was half the size of what the world record is. Wow. Um, but you can go out there and use those same fingernail sized flies and you're catching 20 to 30, 18 plus inch fish a day. <laughs> it is nuts. You get out there in the morning and you're drinking beers on the beach <laughs> and by noon you'll have caught 10 or 12 fish wow. and you wait, wait out the afternoon wool, just kind of leave it out there. But once it starts cooling off in the evening, the fish come back in shallow and you'll see them cruising in pods of 150, 200 fish. Jeez. You just cast your fly out into the middle of it. You've got your bobber and you watch them all swim in. <laughs> and then all of a sudden your bobber's in the middle of the school and you can literally just sit there and count it down. Three, two, <laughs> one, bobber drop, set the hook, get another 18 incher. Dang. But it is so much fun just to explore and travel all the different stuff that Washington Mm. has to offer. Um, We were talking a little bit earlier about some of the trips I've made up to North Idaho or up to Montana to fly fish and all of that stuff's great. But I think not a lot of people realize the opportunity that we have within the state of Washington and you just got to spend a little bit of time figuring it out. But mm-hmm. once you've figured it out, man, you are going to get them. Yeah. You're going to get them yeah. every time you go out, um, which is the best part about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, I love hearing these these stories. Um, okay, one last question for you. Yeah. Where's somewhere that you haven't been, but you really want to go to to fish? Oh, man. Um my number one fly fishing destination that I want to go to right now is New Zealand. Mm. Uh, they have the biggest rainbow trout in the world and they also have some of the biggest brown trout in the world. Um, and I have zero idea how to fish any of that stuff. I just, <laughs> I see all the videos that people post online and they're consistently catching like 12 to 20 pound trout out there, which is absolutely nuts. Um, Plus, I wouldn't mind 
doing the Mordor hike and <laughs> all that other super yeah. cool stuff that New Zealand has to offer. Mm. I mean, that would just be a dream trip in terms of there's such beautiful scenery, yeah. um, a million places to camp out there, but then also it's got some of the best fishing in the world. Um, another one more I'll t touch yeah. on briefly um, <laughs> is I really want to go to Bolivia. Um, they have a, a freshwater fish called uh, Dorado and they are super big, probably averaging three feet long. They're pure gold. They have the hmm. meanest set of jaws you've ever seen on a fish in your life. And they're super aggressive. Hmm. And the best part about it is they live in 20 foot wide creeks that we would fish out here Yeah. versus you fish that stuff out here and you're catching a lot of little eight to 10 inch trout. Yeah. But out there you're catching a 36 pound giant that's going to completely work. Yeah. Um, so I'd say those are my top two fishing destinations that I haven't been, but I really want to go check out at some point in my life. Yeah. Those sound amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those would be some fun fights for sure. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. Well, I appreciate you sharing your, your fishing stories oh, and, thank and you for traveling for those. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. We'll definitely have to, uh, have to chat more and, uh, awesome. Hear some yeah. more stories in the future too. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I really appreciate you having me on the podcast, Kyle. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm excited we finally got to do this. It's, yeah, me too. It's a fun way to spend an afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, we'll see you guys later. <laughs>Hey everybody, Kyle here. If you enjoyed today's show and want more, you can always check out every episode on Spotify, Anchor, YouTube, and now Amazon Music as well. Just search for Our Travel Experiences on any of those platforms and it will pop up. You can also find everything all in one place on my website, OurTravelExp.com. And if you want to see my travel pictures as well as travel pictures from guests on the show, you can check them out on Instagram. The page is called Our Travel Experiences Podcast. And if you want to share your own pictures on the Instagram page or be a guest on the podcast, you can message me via that Instagram page or email me at OurTravelExperiences at Outlook.com. I would love to see your pictures and hear about your travel experiences, so please send them my way. And if that isn't enough for you, make sure to check out my weekly YouTube show from Around the World Fridays. Every Friday, I'm taking five to 10 minutes to answer questions from listeners, share some souvenirs that I bought over the years, um, share my postcards over the years that I've accumulated, or share videos and pictures from one particular city or country that I visited, and so much more. So check it out, guys. You won't be disappointed. And uh, make sure you go subscribe to that as well. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you somewhere around the world soon.